So we talked last time about the role of hemoglobin and its job is to carry both carbon dioxide and oxygen, right? But oxygen, when we're low on oxygen, we really feel the effects of that. So it's nice that we have this little storage molecule to hang on to oxygen to unload it if something should happen to prevent oxygen delivery from the lungs to the blood, like if you're choking or from the vessels to the tissue of the heart in the case of a heart attack. If you have a blood clot, well then you can't have blood flow to the heart and whatever blood is uh, on the other side of the clot will start, un will start unloading its oxygen. But it's only for a very short period of time before we need to replace it with fresh oxygen. So we have about four to five minutes once breathing stops before the tissue cells start to die. And the brain is the most selfish when it comes to oxygen. So it uses a lot of the oxygen. We're gonna talk about that when we get to the cardiovascular system more. But the brain uses a lot of the oxygen that we, and, and the blood that comes is, um, freshly oxygenated out of the heart, the brain takes a lot of that. So if we have lack of blood flow due to the heart stopping and cardiac arrest, if we don't get going with compressions, the brain is gonna take a major hit. And some people will come out of you know, cardiac arrest and or even cardiac surgery, and if their heart is stopped for a period of time, they um, can't function, you know, they're um, obtunded, we call it. The word obtunded means just kind of staring and like not really with it. You know, you talk to people and they just look at you like there's nothing there. And over time it gets better. I've seen some people go from severely obtunded where they need to be reminded to sit down and they can't talk or respond or feed themselves um, to talking and walking and leaving the hospital. So it's, in, it's incredible how the brain can recover in some cases. But then in other cases, we've had people, you know, come out from these events comatose and they never wake up because the brain took too hard of a hit. And that's where we have to make the decision if we're going to continue that way, you know, and send them to a nursing home and live, you know, just a life of total, being totally dependent on others or not. And one thing that I've seen that is difficult for families to understand is that people can have such brain damage from lack of oxygen that um, they'll never recover because the cerebrum took a major hit and it cannot recover, that the cells died and they cannot ever participate and have a conversation or do anything consciously. But they'll say, oh, he's coughing or he's hiccuping or he's sneezing. Well, so those are some functions that are at the brainstem level and brainstem is not for thinking and processing and making voluntary movements. Those are just reflexes and protective mechanisms that people with very low brain function can still do. So we don't want to be, um, unfortunately, you know, thinking that that's a sign of life and, and interaction because it isn't. So hemoglobin, very important molecule. So we talked about red blood cells and white blood cells are formed in the bone marrow. So we're gonna talk about erythropoiesis. Erythro means red. So if someone has erythema, that means they have uh, red, redness around an area. So just look at that prefix and remember red. And it's related to blood flow. When we see redness, it means increased blood flow. And if a person has an infection, that's a sign of infection is when you look at a, a cut that should normally just be healing and you see uh, a, the skin is red around the perimeter, you know, the healthy skin that's intact. If it's red, that's a sign of infection. So we really have to pay attention to that when we're looking at patients if you see, or yourselves or relatives or kids. If you see redness around it, it needs attention. It needs an antibiotic. So how this occurs then, our red blood cells, we said they don't have a nucleus, so they have a limited lifespan. They live two to three months, and then they need to be replaced. So this process of red blood cell production is called erythropoiesis. And what's kind of nice is we have a, a hormone called erythropoietin, so right here in blue. It's a hormone secreted by the kidneys when there's low oxygen levels. And what it does is it increases red blood cell production. So if a person has crappy lungs, they're gonna have low oxygen, right? So the kidneys are gonna be stimulated to, to increase this hormone erythropoietin, and that hormone acts on the bone marrow to increase red blood cell production. So bad lungs is gonna cause it, 
living at high altitudes, right, where there's less oxygen in the air, is going to cause an increased erythropoietin production. Or people that have any type of anemia or, or you know, low oxygen levels for whatever underlying condition they have, that's going to increase erythropoietin. Well, athletes have gotten wind of that, and they've had their doctors actually take blood out of their bodies, store it for a while. That will increase erythropoietin production, so they'll have more red blood cells, and then they'll give them that blood back closer to the event where they're going to participate. It's called blood doping. And so when they do testing looking for artificial hormones or enhancers, they're clear, but they did do something with a doctor's care that's illegal. Blood doping is illegal. And Lance Arms, not Lance, yeah, Lance Armstrong, right, the, the bicyclist? He lost the trophy for the Tour de France because he was caught blood doping. And then he tattled on a bunch of other people that were blood doping as well. So um, it's a big problem. And they do test people's blood. They test what's called the hematocrit. The hematocrit is a measure of the red blood cells you have in your system. And too high of a hematocrit, how is that, how is that detrimental, do you think? How is that bad for the body to have a high hematocrit, which means you have a lot of red blood cells? So if I look at my little vial here, if I increase this volume of red blood cells and make it higher so there's less plasma, how would that be a problem, do you think? What'd you say? Um, maybe, but I, I think that isn't, um, you're still going to have the components of plasma, you're just adding more t to this part. So what would happen when that, what happens when blood gets thicker, do you think? Clotting. Clotting, yeah. That's the big issue with people that have high hematocrits. They're a little bit more at risk for clotting problems. So it's a dangerous practice. And again, a doctor's care, you know, is how they do it. But it's still illegal and not appropriate. But it's a great thing for people that need help, you know, making more red blood cells when there's low oxygen in the environment, like again, at high altitudes. So that's why, where are, where's our Olympic training center? What? Yeah, in Colorado, where it's at higher altitude, so people can make their own red blood cells just by practicing in those conditions. Or look at the big runners that come from Ethiopia. You know, some of those areas are mountainous, and that's how they get those that ability to run at high speeds is they just have more red blood cells delivering oxygen to those working muscles. So how do we break down our red blood cells then? What happens is the hemoglobin breaks down. In the, so the red blood cells eventually break. Their membranes break. The plasma membrane breaks down. It releases the contents, which is the hemoglobin. That protein breaks down into heme and globin. And if we look at the heme, so if we start at number one here, the globin is broken down into different amino acids, which can be recycled and used by the body to make other proteins. The heme binds to iron, and which becomes trans, which is a trans, there's a transport protein called transferrin, which binds iron. So the heme and the iron are bound to transferrin, and it's stored in the liver. The heme, part of it, so that, that's where the iron goes. The other part of the heme is the biliverdin portion. It's another molecule. You don't need to know the details of that. But it's broken down into bilirubin, which is, has a yellow pigment, which then is processed by the liver and converted to bile, which then is stored in the, part of that is stored in the gallbladder. And the rest goes to the intestine to help us break down fat in our digestive tract. So it's pretty amazing how we take these products and use them for other purposes. But what happens if you have a bad liver and you have all this extra bilirubin floating around from your red blood cells, you know, breaking down over time like they all do, but the liver can't process the bilirubin? It stays in the blood, right? So bilirubin is a yellow pigment, stays in the blood, and as a result, a person gets this yellow pigment to their eyes and skin, and it's called jaundice. 
So when we have liver disease or excess red blood cell breakdown, so there's other conditions that cause this, um, you end up having that yellow skin and the yellow um, whites to the eyes. So often cirrhosis of the liver, hepatitis is a big problem. So people that are in the late stages of alcoholism will come in with jaundice and a lot of edema. So babies sometimes are jaundice. All six of my babies were jaundice when they were born. They never, um, if it gets really bad, the excess bilirubin can do brain damage. So doctors really watch the levels very closely in babies that are going home with a little bit of jaundice. And when I worked on pediatrics, we had babies in for jaundice, and they would have to be under lights in their crib, little billy lights. It's a UV light, because UV light breaks down bilirubin. Because some babies, when they're born, their liver is immature, and it can't process the bilirubin, so they turn a little orange. So my husband is Greek, so our babies often had a little bit of a darker skin tone compared to my skin tone, so people all thought it was that. But if you add that yellowish tint to it and look for the eyes, you can see that it was yellow. So the babies always looked like they had a little bit of a suntan, so it wasn't necessarily really severe, and I didn't have to bring them in to go under the billy lights. But another thing they do, too, is they have the mothers wrap them in a billy blanket. So there's like a, a blanket with UV lights embedded into it. And then anytime, because you don't want to just keep a baby that's brand new sitting under, because they have to be under the lights so many hours a day. You don't want them just sitting in a crib all day by themselves when they're just born, right? They should be held and breastfed and all that kind of stuff. So they wrap them in this blanket when they're holding them to keep the lights on their bare skin. And it has to be really high temperature in the room so they don't get chilly because they're just in a diaper and we're exposing their skin, most of their skin, to this light. Yes? That's what they would recommend in the old days. Yeah, just keep the baby in the sunshine because, again, that'll break down the bilirubin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah, that's, that's how they used to do it. Yeah, but, um, but if yours probably wasn't as bad if they were doing home treatment, but there are kids that had to go in and, and get that. Um, and another thing that they mention is uh, it's processed uh, through the intestines. So babies that have high bilirubin, they just tell moms to just breastfeed them a lot. So they poop it out, essentially. And that's how they get rid of that excess bilirubin is through the stool. So they say, you know, just feed it. Feed it a lot. Okay, so um, that's Jonas. And that's what talks about the blue light therapy. Kxalate. Yeah. Kxalate gets rid of ammonia. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's the ammonia levels because when we eat protein, like meats and cheeses and things, um, it gets broken down into ammonia, and then the liver breaks that down into another molecule. I forget what it is right now. Urea, I think. Yes, urea. Um, I think it's been a while now. I have to don't quote me on that. <laughs> pretty sure though. I'm pretty sure. Um, but um, the ammonia levels build up and causes uh, the brain to be not less functional, and they act like they have Alzheimer's. People that have high ammonia levels will act crazy. That's yeah, yeah. Right. So we give them this laxative which is fun, right? You take care of a patient that has all these issues and now we induce a violent diarrhea on top of it. So, and they're confused. Yeah, and they're confused, so you're trying to, you know, take care of them with all those issues. It's, yeah, unfortunate. Okay, so let's talk about the white blood cells. We talked about these in labs, so I'm not gonna have you identify them, but I do want you to know what their major functions are. Neutrophils are phagocytes, which means they're like little Pac-Men chewing up bacteria and debris in infected areas, tissues, or in the blood. So these are the most numerous, and they are high in bacterial infections. Eosinophils and basophils are inflammatory, so they, are there, they come on board to reduce um, in uh, the, I shouldn't say they reduce, they're involved in allergies. 
So a lot of eosinophils on board can reduce inflammation, but basophils, unfortunately, increase inflammation. So people with allergies and all the, you know, inflamed airways, inflamed nasal passages, inflamed skin, itching, all those things are related to histamine. Because what do we take when we have allergic issues? Antihistamines, right? Like Benadryl is a real common antihistamine. And there's other longer acting ones like Claritin and, oh, what's the one that starts? Zyrtec, Loratadine, you know, all those. Um, break down or prevent the histamine response. But these are really big in people with allergies. Lymphocytes um, are, are B cells and T cells, so they make antibodies. Um, B cells are more the antibody maker, though. Um, T cells are the front line of our immune system. And you'll, we'll talk more about that when you do the immune system work. Um, and then monocytes are macrophages, so they become phagocytic, just like the neutrophils. Um, when you have infection on board. So a magic number we use for looking at the total number of white blood cells in someone's blood is 10 to 11,000. If it's greater than 11,000, we say the person has some type of infection. So when you come in, you're really feeling poorly, they say, well, we're going to send you to the lab. They take you to the lab, they'll look at the total white blood cell count, and if it's elevated, like 20,000, that's what we see in patients that have like active pneumonia and things, we know you're sick. You know, we know something's going on. But if your white blood cell count is perfect, then we might say there's something else going on, you know, maybe some, you know, hypothyroidism or, or some other issue. If someone is on uh, chemotherapy, their white blood cell count will be really low because we, when we give people chemo to kill cancerous cells, we sometimes kill white blood cells too in the process. And that is a reason why they have to wear a mask when they're out in public. So when you see people with a mask out in public, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're infectious, but people around them are infectious and they're trying to stay healthy while they go out and about and do their grocery shopping. So um, you'll sometimes see patients in the hospital too that they ask you to wear a gown and a mask if you go in their room because they're on what's called neutropenic precautions. Neutropenia means too few of neutrophils and they can't fight infection. So don't send flowers to someone, fresh flowers to someone who is on chemotherapy or has cancer or has a weakened immune system and is in the hospital because fresh flowers bring in organisms, fungal organisms that get in the air and then they breathe it in and they can get sick from that. So uh, there's certain precautions we take with people that are neutropenic. So these are the different white blood cells. A good way to remember them in order of um, how numerous they are. So these are the most numerous, second numerous, third, fourth, you know, the least numerous. So never let monkeys eat bananas. And that's how to remember the order of those white blood cells. Thrombocytes are also called platelets. So they're important in preventing blood loss when we have small little cuts. They only live five to nine days, so we're constantly making new ones. So when you cut yourself, you're cutting little tiny blood vessels in that tissue. When you start to see bleeding, you've cut through capillaries. So the first reaction is a reflex, which is called vascular spasm. So what happens is the blood vessel constricts, and that reduces blood flow and prevents blood loss. So that's a great reaction, right? And then the platelets that are passing by that damaged tissue area are attracted to the damaged tissue because it releases, the damaged tissue releases chemicals and they start to stick to that damaged part of the capillary. And then the platelets release chemicals that make it even more sticky. So more platelets as they come passing by, they stick. And if it's a minor paper cut, that's all we need. Is platelets form a little plug, we put a little pressure and the bleeding stops, we're done. But like I talked about in lab, if you slice your finger with a knife slicing a tomato, then you need a little more help. Then you need the coagulation process to kick in. So hemostasis, stasis means to stop. So this is when we're stopping bleeding. It's the process of stopping bleeding. So make sure you define that term if you don't know the word hemostasis. Like if you see it on the test question, for example, Make sure you know that means stopping bleeding. So 
Without hemostasis, we would bleed out our entire blood volume. And people with, you know, clotting disorders like hemophilia, that's a real problem for them. They need to be prepared and have their clotting factors nearby. So here's what a platelet plug looks like. So you have all these little chemicals that are released. And then we have something in our blood called fibrinogen, which comes in and helps bind these platelets together to form a little plug to plug the hole. And the tissue is collagen that the platelets stick to. So we have, we've talked about collagen before, collagen fibers that we find in tissues. It's a protein. So when we coagulate blood with more severe cuts and bleeding, there's a couple of steps that have to occur. So first of all, we have to activate this enzyme that's in the blood, and that is activated by chemicals relate, uh, that are released during tissue damage. And then we have a protein in our blood that is called prothrombin. It's converted to thrombin. And then thrombin acts as an enzyme to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So this yellow that you see here, that's fibrin. It's, a, it's an insoluble, so it, it's normally, fibrinogen is dissolved in our blood and we can't see it. Remember we talked about that, fibrinogen last time, it was one of the three proteins in our plasma. Remember it was albumin, globulins, and fibrinogen. So this fibrinogen is normally invisible in our blood, it's dissolved, but when it is converted by thrombin, so thrombin acts as an enzyme and changes fibrinogen to fibrin, which is a visible thread-like protein that sticks to damaged tissue and catches the red blood cells flying by and forms a clot. So that's what the yellow is here. So that third step, when we convert fibrinogen to fibrin, we've formed a clot. So a clot is a network of fibrin threads that traps red blood cells, platelets, and fluid in that, in that area. And that's good. Then we stop our bleeding, right? So here's another example. So if I look at this in a little more detail, the whole chemical process is listed on the side here. We have the intrinsic pathway, and we have the extrinsic pathway. So the intrinsic pathway is what is in the blood. So intrinsic, think of in the blood itself. There's factors in the blood that contribute to clotting. Extrinsic are factors outside the blood that contribute to clotting. So in the tissues, there's factors that contribute to clotting. So we have, I'm not gonna have you memorize this entire clotting pathway because it's really detailed and you know, are you gonna remember it next week after the test? Probably not, right? So we're gonna go the major details, what ion is hugely important in both the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway? Can you see it? It's pretty small. I don't know why it's so fuzzy, but yeah, calcium is in the extrinsic pathway and it's also part of the intrinsic pathway. So if a person has low blood calcium, what are they at risk for? We already know that muscle contraction will be a problem because that plays a role. Calcium plays a role there. We know that strengthening of our bones is an important role of calcium, but now we've just identified a third role of calcium. What's their problem going to be if they're low calcium? Bleeding. Bleeding and, and not being able to form clots as well because calcium plays a role in both processes. And at the end of both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, we're able to activate prothrombin, which is what's necessary to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So again, the phases are activating prothrombin with all these little factors. See these little, the factor eight, and we have factor nine. So all those factors are smaller molecules that are dissolved in plasma. And that's what's missing in people with hemophilia. They're missing some of those clotting factors that are part of the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. So all I want you guys to really pay attention is that there's two pathways. The intrinsic pathway is in the blood. The extrinsic pathway is in the tissues. Both require calcium and the end result is activating prothrombin to thrombin 
to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So what happens when you clot? Do you want to keep clots there? We're clotting all the time, actually. We're getting little injuries inside of our bodies all the time. And we don't pay attention to it because we have another protein that comes in and cleans things up after we've formed a clot. Or heaven forbid you had surgery and you formed little clots as a result of the surgery. Let's say you had ankle surgery and there's little clots forming around that area. What do we do? We give people blood thinners like heparin but we don't want those hanging around, so we have something else that can come in and take care of business. So if you have a clot that was formed, say, by your ankle, or let's say you have atrial fibrillation and you decide, I don't want to take my blood thinner because I cut myself shaving all the time and it's a waste of time. Well, now the blood is starting to clot in that atria because the atria are not contracting enough with atrial fibrillation, so blood sits, forms little clots, travels through your heart, goes through your lungs, goes up to your brain and gets stuck. What do we call that? A clot in the brain. Stroke. So that is an embolism. We call that an embolism because it was formed in the heart from the blood pooling from the atrial fibrillation, but it formed a clot. It traveled through the body and got stuck in the brain. Let's say you form a clot in your ankle from surgery, and this happened. We had a patient that had ankle surgery, was a college student, had ankle surgery, and formed a bunch of clots. He broke his ankle playing a sport. Um, had a bunch of clots forming in his lungs, and he couldn't breathe. What do we call that when you have a clot in your lung? Called PE, pulmonary embolism, yeah. And people can die from that. My, my grandmother died from that suddenly. She was discharging from the hospital. She had knee replacement surgery, and this was back in the 80s, so we probably weren't very good about giving blood thinners correctly back then. So she had knee surgery. She was feeling great, got up to use the bathroom, suddenly became very short of breath, and died within 10 minutes. They couldn't revive her, and they found that she had a massive blood clot in her lung that had formed from the knee. So very, very serious stuff, and this is why we need to get our patients walking. Letting them sit around and tell you that, no, they're not going to get up and walk. They just want to lay there increases their risk for blood clots. We need to move around. Same thing with you guys. If you're taking a long flight overseas and you're sitting in that plane for 12 hours, even eight hours, need to get up and walk and, and pump your calf muscles and move because blood clots when it sits. What? There's two types of aneurysms. One aneurysm is what causes a stroke. It's a clot stuck in the vessels serving the brain in the cranial, in the artery, the cerebral arteries, get stuck. And the other type of aneurysm is called hemorrhagic, when you have a weakening of the blood vessel in the brain and it just bursts and causes massive bleeding and blood loss to the brain and people die from that. And the, the, the hemorrhagic kind is the kind that affects people of any age. Um, you know, people have died in their 20s, 30s, and 40s of hemorrhagic aneurysms. So the good news is it's very rare doesn't have what um, we know smoking is increases the risk of, of weakening blood vessels like people with abdominal aneurysms where they've got this pulsating weakened vessel in their you know down their midline in that large vessel we'll talk about the vessels this week um, smoking is a big factor for that and heavy drinking is another risk factor for aneurysm but some people just just get it um, but again it's rare so if someone complains about a bad, bad headache that is like nothing they've ever had before, they should always be seen. Don't just go to bed with an unusually weird headache. You, and people that have migraines, you know what migraines feel like, right? But if it's unusually different, always be seen because those are you know, early signs of embolism. Or not embolism, hemorrhagic stroke, bursting blood, ves blood vessels. So that's why they put those squeezers on people's legs, you know, that puff up and squeeze and then they relax. We call them sequential compression devices, and that keeps blood flowing from the legs. And again, having a person with bad lungs, so you know they've got an increased hematocrit, high EPO secretion from bad lungs, letting them sit in the chair with puffy legs and not moving those legs at all, they're put, you're putting them at risk for blood clots. So we got to keep people moving. So if it's, if it's in your arms or legs, it's called a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. So a thrombus is a blood clot that stays where it was formed. Like I had a person in nursing school here that talked about she was on birth control, and birth control increases the risk for blood clots. 
and I'm not sure why I've never analyzed it. There is an explanation, I'm sure. Um, so she said that she was getting ready for work one day, and all of a sudden her arm really felt um, achy, and the muscles were just burning in her arm anytime she used it at all, and it got worse and worse, and pretty soon her arm was looking pale and cool and really ached. So she went to the doctor and identified her with a blood clot, and they were able to um, you know, resolve it, but she had to be on a blood thinner for a long time after that. So something to be aware of. Um, pulmonary embolism is in the lungs. We talked about that. A heart attack is, a, is a, either an embolism or a thrombus um, serving a coronary artery. So did, if it stays, we call it a thrombus. If it travels around and causes trouble, we call it an embolism again. And then a cerebral vascular accident is called a CVA, otherwise known as a stroke. And I don't, I can't click on this because it's a PV or it's a PDF. So we need to break down these clots. So this guy that came in, this college kid that was all clotted up in his lungs, um, it was really, really serious. And the doctors were very nervous. They said, you know, if one of those breaks away and you know, gets stuck in a major artery, he could die of heart attack or stroke. So they were watching him carefully and they said, we need to thin his blood way down. So to thin a person's blood way down, if they fell or even bumped themselves, they would have massive bleeding. So this guy had to stay in bed the whole time, this college kid. And when he came in, he was athletic. So he was like, oh, I'll do my bed bath, no problem. He'd clean himself up, he'd give him the rags. He wanted privacy, he was a 21-year-old guy. You know, and then after about a week, I come back, you know, because I'm just on call, I come back and I was assigned to him. And they're like, yeah, um, he's doing okay. You know, he's on strict bed rest, has to use a urinal and bedpan, can't get out of bed because his blood is really thin. And it's re be, be prepared, it really smells in there. I'm like, why is that? Because he doesn't want us to wash him up because he's embarrassed. But he's too weak. We give him the washcloths, but he's too weak and he's not doing a good job. I'm like, oh my God. So, of course, I mean, 21-year-old, you guys are in your 20s. How would you smell after a week of no showering? <laughs> Probably not so good, right? So, so I went in there and just put my mom hat on and said, you know what, we need to clean you up. You just have to let us do this, and we're just going to get this done, and you'll feel a lot better. And he's like, okay. So, you know, if you, if you don't, you know, kind of push people, they're going to say no, right? But if you just say, you know doesn't smell real fresh in here and you're gonna have a lot of you know, visitors. Can we just clean you up and I'll be real quick about it. Okay, so we did, he was fine. And then his, you know, um, everything was clear and then, you know, he discharged and he's perfectly fine today. So we need this factor to break down clots. It's called plasmin. So this is another thing that with the help of all these enzymes that are present in our blood, we can make plasmin, which will dissolve the clot. So eventually, we need to dissolve clots that form. So TPA is a really important chemical that we give patients in the early hours of stroke. If we can get to them within hours of onset of stroke, we can dissolve that clot that's in their brain, and they can be symptom-free of ever having had an issue. The biggest issue is people start to have symptoms of stroke, they don't identify it, and they go to bed. and then you know, it's much more severe. So we need to get people to a hospital right away. And the biggest way to check for stroke with anybody, like it's the holidays, right? You might have elderly relatives sitting there, then all of a sudden grandpa starts saying, hey, can I pass ball so, so, blah, blah, blah. You're like, what? What are you saying, grandpa? I don't understand that. And that's exactly what happens. They start to talk and they make no sense at all. That's a sign right away. And then all you have to do is say, um, someone, someone was showing stroke symptoms. Someone was like, can you smile for us? Well, the patient was totally stressed out and nervous, and they could not smile. Everybody's yelling, can you do this? And it's like, they're not going to smile. So then I yelled, can you show us your teeth? If you're upset, you can show someone your teeth, right? You're not going to smile. So they went like that, and it was even, so they were OK. But that's another thing. Say, show us your teeth. Put your hands out in front of you, and if one drifts, then we know there's where the clot is on the right side, the left side of the body is going down, right? So it's easy stuff. Any, my uh, husband came in to talk to a, a co-worker that was acting like this, and he didn't know how to assess it. He just said he was talking nonsense, and then he dropped over in his chair and was on the floor, and everybody was freaking out, and my husband had no health background, knew nothing of what to do, but all he saw was that he wasn't breathing because he fell like this, and his neck, his chin was to his chest. 
so all my husband did was just lift up his head and then he started to breathe again and he's okay today so that was good you know they got in, got involved right away so knowing those simple things is really really important and if you can do those three things tell them to repeat a simple statement like can you say the sun is out today just say that back to us that's what we did with this person you know just something simple and if they have that issue saying that that's another sign okay so plasmin dissolves the clot it's called the clot buster and usually begins within two days of forming a clot and it takes a couple days before it's finally dissolved so we have medicines to prevent new clots from forming but we can't break down clots that have already formed unless it's in the early stages and we give them that TPA so that kid that came to us, we thinned his blood down so no new clots would form, but we had to wait for his own body to break down the ones that were already there. So that's the tricky part. So you're best off not having the clots form in the first place by taking the blood thinners appropriately and telling your relatives, any relative that has had a valve replacement, a stent, or has atrial fibrillation needs to be on a blood thinner of some kind. And sometimes it's just aspirin that they recommend people take if it's something really minor, like they had a heart attack and they're at risk for more clots forming, they'll just say take a daily aspirin, either a baby aspirin or just one aspirin to prevent blood clots. But other people need more, you know, um, intense chemicals like, um, oh, what are they? Warfarin, which is called Coumadin, which is comes from rat poison. So when you give your... Um, when you put rat poison down in the basement called decon, it contains warfarin, so when the rat eats it, it causes massive bleeding and hemorrhaging and then it kills the rat. Do you? Oh, you. Yeah. 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 Right, but you weren't contracting the muscles of that injured leg, so you needed that aspirin. Yeah, yep. Okay, so um, next topic are the blood groups. So everybody knows their blood type in here? How many of you know your blood type? Raise your hand if you know your blood type. Okay, not everybody does. And when you, if, if you need to take advanced A&P or you take our general biology here at Western, we do test our blood type. Or human biology, too, we test blood type. So that's kind of interesting and fun. But the, the way it works is our red blood cells have special proteins on them that determine your blood types. So if I look at this chart, if you're blood type A, you have A antigen on your red blood cells. It tells us the protein that are on your red blood cells. And this was determined by genetics. When you were formed from mom and dad's chromosomes coming together, there is a genetic component that determines blood type. So depending on what mom was and what dad was and what was found on sperm and egg, because sperm and you have two copies of every gene, and when sperm and sperm and egg only have one of those two copies. So depending on the copy that was on sperm and the copy that was on egg that came together to form you determines your blood type. So if you have antigen B on your red blood cells, you are type B. If you have both antigens on your red blood cells, you're type AB. And if you have no antigens on your red blood cells, you're type O. So no antigen is O. So then, so you're born with these. And then as you develop your immune system, you start to develop antibodies to the other antigens that are out there that are not on your red blood cells. Because we form antibodies to things that are foreign, right? If it's foreign, your body forms antibodies and is ready to attack if it should come into the body. So what happens if you're blood type A, you're going to have antibodies to B. If you're blood type B, you're going to have antibodies to A, because that's not you. That's foreign, right? Because you have B on your red blood cells. And if you are type AB, you're not going to form any any antibodies, because both of these you're going to recognize because you were born with those, right? It's like Lady Gaga's song. I was born this way, right? And then if you're type O, you're going to form antibodies to both A and B because you were not born with those. Your body's not going to recognize that. So if you're going to give somebody 
red blood cells, that's what we, when you donate blood, they get rid of all the plasma and all that stuff and then give you a small little thin square bag of called packed red blood cells because that's what people need. When they're, you know, low oxygen and bleeding out or a mother that lost a lot of blood with delivery, they're going to give you red blood cells and just that's all they care about. They're not going to pump up the plasma. We'll give you some normal saline to pump up the plasma. We're going to give you the packed red blood cells. So we got to make sure that those red blood cells we're giving that person are not going to cause a problem with the antibodies present in their plasma. So which one is safest to give someone who's bleeding on the roadside and the ambulance comes and they got to give them blood in the ambulance? What, what is the safest red blood cell to give them, do you think? Oh, yeah, because there's less... There's, there's nothing for those antibodies to interact with because the, the red blood cells are clean as a bean, right? But the problem is people that are type O, there's another factor that comes into, line, comes into play called the RH factor. And the RH factor is another antigen present on red blood cells. We call it the D antibody. It's not shown in this particular table, but if you added the letter D to the A, like if we put a D antigen on here, then we would say the person is A positive. If it doesn't have the D antigen, we would say it's A negative. If we put the D antigen on this in addition to the B that's already there, then it would be B positive. If there is no D, B negative. Put a D here, AB positive, no D, AB negative. If I put it on here, just the D, it would be O positive. If there is no D, I say O negative. So here's the bad news. Only 1% of the population is O negative. And that's the truly clean red blood cell, right? There's no D, there's no A, there's no B, there's nothing for that, those antibodies to form an attack. So the issue is then we need everybody to donate because if I'm A positive, can I donate to A positive? Yeah, that's a match, right? So they're going to have the same antibodies in their blood as I have in my blood if I'm A positive. So that's why everybody needs to donate, because heaven forbid there was some major explosion. Like what happened here at Western if we had a packed you know, building of students and there was some gas explosion, we had massive bleeding, we have to give lots of people blood, and there's no blood around to give. That's happened, right? So like Hurricane Katrina, we had a, a blood supply shortage. And O negative is the most important blood to give because we can give that to people that we don't have time to match their blood. So, okay. question. So, uh, is it because the people have your blood will be... If you've been given blood? I haven't heard that. I'm not saying it's incorrect, but I, I haven't heard. Why that would be. Did they tell you that? No, it wasn't the hospital. I was just wondering what they told me that they were giving blood. Oh. Blood huh. I don't know. I have no idea. I haven't heard that. We could look it up, though. Okay. Interesting. I mean, I'd be curious to know that. So what happens then um, if you are O negative? We call you the universal donor. What's the best one to be? Who can get any type of blood? AB, because you don't have any antibodies to cause any trouble. So if you're AB positive, that's the best blood type to be because, you know, you can get, it, you can get anybody's blood. And it's funny, um, my kids, I got little cards in the mail. It must have been through the hospital. They're asking them to donate. And all six of my kids are AB positive. So what does that tell you? I know that I'm A positive. I know that for my blood type. Yeah, my husband is B positive because, and we have, so that means my two genes are both A and his two genes are both B, so six times, one A, one B, A, B, and we're both positive, so A, B positive kids six times. But if he was O, he would have nothing to give, and I have A, if he were O, all my kids would be A because O has nothing to give. There's no antigen. It's a recessive allele. So the A and the B are co-dominant and they're going to contribute. Yes? No. But if I have a husband who's negative, let's say he's B negative, and I am 
positive if he contributes the negative gene and uh, the child is negative, the problem with that is my antibodies would attack that child if there is mixing of blood during delivery. And then my exposure, no, I'm sorry, it's the other way around, a negative mom with a positive dad, sorry. Negative mom, positive dad, so you have a positive baby the negative mom will form antibodies and can cause problems in the newborn. So that's what the, we call the Rh factor. So what happens is the, the antibodies attack the red blood cells and cause massive clotting. So if you have a mother who's Rh negative attacking a positive baby, it causes massive clump, clumping and clotting in that baby and can kill the kill the baby. So what they do is they give mothers a shot of what's called Rogam halfway through their pregnancy and all the antibodies will bind to the Rogam and it'll leave the baby alone. So it's really, really important. So we, do we just go off the mother or do we test every mother? Every negative mother gets Rogam. What if she says, well, my husband's negative, so we're good, or my partner is negative, so we don't need, I don't need that Rogam. Do we trust mothers to be to know who fathers are all the time? If you ever watch like Ricky Lake or those types of shows, you know that it's not, it's not always the case, right? So the rule in healthcare is every Rh negative mother gets Rogam in case that baby's Rh positive, and it's going to cause a incompatibility and clumping of antibodies. So so if you are O negative. Only 1% of the population can donate to 99% of the population. We need you to donate. Oh, 7% of the population, sorry. So another condition of red blood cells is sickle cell anemia. Is the, cell, the red blood cells have abnormal hemoglobin, and they form a sickle. This is a sickle shape. A sickle is a tool that you use to like cut brush. It's a curved blade on the end of a wooden stick, and you use it to like go through tropical forests and grasses and things like that. So it causes that to happen. So what happens when blood is flowing through the red blood, that are through the capillaries? Instead of going through a single file and just kind of flopping around these nice, smooth, round blood vessels, they clump up and clot. So sickle cell anemia is a problem that when the oxygen levels get low, again, bad lungs, high altitudes, lots of exercise, seizures, anything that's causing oxygen usage to go up and delivery to go down is going to cause clumping and problems. So these people need to have good oxygen levels to prevent that clumping. The ironic part, though, is if you have sickle cell anemia, you are immune to malaria because malaria infects red blood cells, but it can't infect those that have the sickle cell gene for whatever, I haven't analyzed the details behind that, but there is an answer. It's beyond the scope of our class. Um, so, those, so that's why it's stayed alive in the gene pool. If you carry the gene for sickle cell, um, you're le more likely to survive malaria and go on and reproduce and have kids and pass that gene along. So we see it in people that come from countries where there's a high amount of malaria. So people of like an African descent, sickle cell anemia is in their gene pool. So people like black Americans, even though it's been a long time since they've had ancestors in Africa, we do see them with sickle cell anemia. It's in the gene pool and it's a real problem. It affects you know their lifespan if they have um, a more severe form because they have two genes for sickle cell, they are really ill. If they have just one gene, they're not as ill. So let's um, take a look. We're going to stop at this point and pick up in the next video with the cardiovascular system.